everyone and welcome to the world of maritime archaeology. My name is Jasmine and I'm an archaeologist that works for the Maritime Archaeology Trust. I'll be talking to you today about what maritime archaeology is, the sorts of really interesting things that we find, and how we go about finding out more about them. So let's dive straight in with our first question. What even is archaeology anyway? Well, Archaeology is the study of all of human history. That includes everything from ancient cave paintings from thousands of years ago, right through to more recent history like the First and the Second World Wars. Unlike history, which looks at written documents and pictures for information, archaeology uses material remains to find out about the past. The objects, the buildings, the physical things that people have left behind. Now, I want you to use your imaginations for me for a moment. I want you to imagine that you're in a desert. The sun is beating down, blazing hot, and as you walk you can feel soft sand shifting underneath your feet. You walk and you walk, until suddenly your foot hits something different, something hard. You brush away the sand, and you uncover a step. Excited, you call your friends over, and together you begin to dig down, down into the sand, revealing a set of stone steps long buried beneath the earth. As you go down the steps, it gets cooler and darker, so you bring torches to light the way, until finally you reach the bottom and find a corridor. At the end of the corridor, you find a set of carved stone doors, held shut for thousands of years by rope and a clay seal. Very carefully, you break the seal. You unwind the rope. With an enormous creak, you swing open the doors. And inside, you find the tomb of Tutankhamun. You've just followed in the footsteps of one of the most famous archaeologists of all time, Sir Howard Carter. Now, he studied just one kind of archaeology called Egyptology, which, as it sounds like, is the study of ancient Egypt. All of human history is a very big subject, so we tend to split it down into smaller subjects, like a specific place, time period, object or technique. This means that there are lots of different kinds of archaeology, each of which looks at different things. For example, there's archaeozoology, which looks at the remains of animals, mostly their bones, from archaeological sites. Studying archaeozoology can tell us about what people hunted in the past, what they farmed, what they scavenged, how they used them for food, to make tools, and even kept them as pets. There's also archaeobotany, which looks at ancient plants. Archaeobotany can tell us about what ancient people were eating, growing, and using for medicines. We can also use plant remains to figure out what the environment looked like in the past. So if we find the remains of a plant that liked to live by fresh water, that might tell us that there was a lake nearby, even if there isn't one there today. Then there's osteoarchaeology. This part of archaeology looks at bones. And looking at bones can tell us all sorts of things about people's diets, what diseases they might have had, and even sometimes their jobs. On the shipwreck of the Mary Rose, for example, you can tell which people were the archers on the ship because their shoulder bones looked a little bit different to those that didn't use a bow very often. There's also experimental archaeology, which uses ancient techniques and methods to recreate objects and structures to see how they worked. The people pictured here are testing out stone tools on animal skins, maybe to see what shapes a tool works best or to figure out how people turned those animal skins into useful things like bags and clothes. There are a lot more areas of archaeology, but I'm here today to talk about maritime archaeology, which looks at everything to do with the past in and around the water. This means in the sea and in the rivers and in the lakes, but also in the intertidal zone, and that's the area between the land and the sea, so the beaches and the mudflats. So, what would we expect to find beneath the waves? Well, there's plenty of fish and wildlife, of course, like crabs and lobsters, but we leave the study of those to the marine biologists. There's probably a good few fossils too, but these fossils belong to a time long before humans were around. And remember, archaeologists study human history, 
so we leave the fossils to the paleontologists. There's probably a lot of rubbish down there on the seabed too. Shopping trolleys, fishing nets, plastic bottles. And although these will one day be archaeology, for now we're not interested in those either. There are, however, lots of things we are interested in. Shipwrecks, downed aeroplanes, bones, even whole landscapes that have been covered over by the sea. Now, shipwrecks are, of course, a big part of the maritime archaeologist's job. Around the coast of Britain, there are records of over 40,000 ships sinking, but only some of these have actually been found on the seabed. There are likely to be a lot more shipwrecks that we don't have a record of, so the real number could be much, much higher. Some of the earliest evidence for boats in the UK are from the Mesolithic, dating to about 11,000 years ago. Boats around this time would have looked like a basket, called a coracle, a flat raft, or perhaps a canoe made from a large log. Vessels that were made up of separate planks of wood could have been around in late prehistory from about 6,000 years ago onwards, but by the time we get to the Roman period, there are lots of different kinds of vessels around, from small boats for local rivers to large seagoing trading ships and warships. Shipwrecks can tell us a lot about the past because they usually capture a specific moment in time when the ship sank. They can contain all sorts of things, including cargo, ship's equipment, clothes, food, and personal items belonging to the crew and to the passengers. It's possible that material can survive quite well underwater, especially when it's buried under sand or mud. When it's buried, there's not a lot of air around it, so all the bacteria that makes things rot and break down can't survive. And that's why we still find things like wood and rope hundreds of years later that wouldn't survive so well on land. Probably one of the most famous shipwrecks of all time is the Titanic. The Titanic sank in 1912 after running into an iceberg on her first voyage. It was, at the time, one of the largest and fanciest ships in the world, but when it sank, many people lost their lives. The remains of the Titanic now lie very deep under the water, and it's quite badly damaged. Unfortunately, the wreck of the Titanic is unlikely to last much longer, as it's breaking down really rapidly, partly in thanks to a bacteria that likes to eat the rusting metal so they're expecting that most of the structure may collapse within the next 20 years. Another shipwreck that you might have heard of is the Mary Rose. Now, this ship was part of King Henry VIII's navy and launched in 1511. It was used in war against France, but in 1545, during the Battle of Solent, the ship sank. 437 years later, the Mary Rose was raised back up to the surface, and it now has its own museum filled with amazingly well-preserved artefacts like leather boots and knit combs. Of course, there are also so many shipwrecks out there that aren't famous at all, but just as important for telling us about the maritime past. This ship is called the SS Camberwell. It lies off the coast of the Isle of Wight, but it was travelling from London to India with a large cargo when it hit a mine during the First World War and sank. Among many other things, it was carrying books, champagne, clothing, bicycle parts, footballs, lamps, medicine, perfume and sponges. Although the ship itself is of quite a common type, because it was on a long journey and had such a varied cargo on board, it gives us a really good snapshot of life at the time, from the food that was being eaten to the things that people liked to buy. But also, on a bigger scale, it shows international trade at work. You can see some of the artefacts from the Camberwell at the Shipwreck Centre and Maritime Museum on the Isle of Wight. As well as shipwrecks, unfortunately sometimes aircraft end up at the bottom of the sea as well, but there's not nearly as many of these as there are shipwrecks. In 2019, the wreckage of one such aircraft was recovered off the coast of Portsmouth. It was on a test flight during the Second World War when it crashed, but thankfully the pilot survived. It's only one of two known examples of this type of aircraft, and the artefacts from it include one of the pilot's boots and a delicate instrument that measured the aircraft's airspeed. But it's not just shipwrecks that maritime archaeologists study. We also look at submerged landscapes. These are landscapes that have been covered over by the sea when sea levels rise. In the past, sea level has at times been higher than it is now, and at other times it was much, much lower. About 9,000 years ago, sea levels were in fact so low that you could still walk over to mainland Europe. When land is uncovered by the sea, plants, people and animals, they all move on to it. And then when the sea level rises again, 
they move away, but they leave the traces of their homes and their lives behind. And that's why we find things on the seabed that we might not expect to find in the water, like the bones of land animals, stone tools, or even tree stumps. From these submerged landscapes, we often recover these prehistoric stone tools. They were usually made from a type of stone called flint, which when broken is really sharp. Bone tools were also used, but bone doesn't survive quite as well as stone, so we don't find quite so many of those. The oldest stone tools date to about 3.3 million years ago, and they were made in Africa by another species that predated humans. Human beings began to make stone tools about 2.6 million years ago, and stone continued to be the main material for tools until metalworking was discovered in the Bronze Age. Flints could be used to make arrowheads, axes and spear points, so they came in lots of shapes and sizes. Some of the most common ones are hand axes, which are teardrop shaped and probably would have been used in a lot of different ways, from chopping wood to processing animal and vegetable material for food. Scrapers are usually smaller and rounder, and then you have microliths. These are very small flakes of flint, which would have been used in both tools and weapons. We also have a better chance of finding organic remains at underwater landscape sites than we do from sites the same age on land, because the underwater sites are usually buried in mud. Organic means anything made up of living matter, including things like leaves, wood, cloth and human and animal remains. We're currently investigating a site called Boldner Cliff, which is just off the Isle of Wight and is about 8,000 years old. As well as lots of flint, we've recovered organic remains like wood with tool marks still on it, leaves that are so well preserved that they could have come off a tree this year, and one of the oldest pieces of string in the UK. However, maritime archaeology isn't just about the stuff under the water. Maritime archaeologists also study the intertidal zone, and this is the area between the land and the sea, like the beaches and the mudflats. You don't have to wear scuba gear to get to these places, but there are other things to watch out for, like tides and sinking in the mud. The intertidal zone is also home to lots of wildlife, and some areas may be protected so people don't disturb these animals' homes. In these areas, we might still find the remains of ships which have been abandoned, which we call hulks. And we can also look at remains related to shipbuilding, like slipways, jetties and boat building yards. The remains of coastal defences, like these structures here called pillboxes, or forts, or anti-tank defences, are also present, as well as traces of coastal industries, like oyster farming pens, places where they made salt from seawater, or bricks for building with. Sometimes we can even find things that used to be under the water, but have been washed up onto the shore, especially after big storms. So one of the first things we do when we look at any archaeological site is to do lots of research on it. The information comes from lots of different places, like people who have dived it before, historical documents and archives, and even family records. We can go to places like the National Archives in London, which is like a big library for old documents, and from here we can find lots of things including letters, photographs, official reports, maps, diary entries, new papers, and even more. And from this information, we might be able to find out details about what a ship was carrying, where it was headed, and who the captain and the crew were. Quite often though, there won't be any historical documents that can give us information on a site, especially if they are really old and from a time before people started to write things down. And in this case, we get most of our information from actually visiting the site. In order to look at archaeological remains beneath the sea, we often have to go under the water, which can be quite different from working on the land. If you're diving around the UK, the water is usually pretty cold, especially the deeper you go. It also gets darker, and often there's lots of mud and seaweed and other bits floating around in the water that can make it really murky. You're also working quite a short time limit, as you can only stay down for as long as you have air in your air tanks. You can't really talk under the water either, so it becomes a bit more difficult to communicate. And because of all that, it's definitely more difficult to work under the water. The divers who do get to go down there, however, have lots of training to make sure they can do their job safely. Now, in order to work under the water, you need to wear scuba kit. This consists of a wetsuit or dry suit, which keeps you warm in the cold water, a mask so that you can see, fins to make swimming around easier, 
weights to help you sink down rather than float, a buoyancy control device which helps the diver adjust their buoyancy in the water, and of course your air tank which is attached by a hose to a regulator which is the bit that goes in your mouth and that you breathe through. As underwater archaeologists we also use extra tools to help us record and investigate sites, some of which are also used by land archaeologists and some of which aren't. We have our scuba gear of course, which land archaeologists don't need, and maritime archaeologists will usually travel to their sites by boat rather than a car like a land archaeologist. However, all archaeologists can use a camera to record sites and artefacts, tape measures, trowels for digging, bags for carrying samples, and tags to help them label things across the site. Some of the sites we look at, however, are much too deep and dangerous for us to go down to ourselves. And for these sites, we use ROVs, which stands for Remotely Operated Vehicles. Now, these are underwater robots that can range in size from about the size of a football right up to the size of a small car. They'll often be equipped with a camera and sometimes other tools like grabbing arms. And an ROV pilot will sit on a ship in front of a lot of screens and control the robot under the water. And if you've ever seen the film The Titanic, you'll see an ROV in the opening few minutes exploring the wreck. And this is because the Titanic is over three and a half kilometres under the water, so far too deep for divers. Some underwater sites, though, are far too dangerous to visit at all. Now, pictured here is the site of the SS Richard Montgomery, which went down during the Second World War in 1944 in the Thames Estuary. When it sank, it was carrying a massive amount of explosive material for use in the war, bombs, charges and ammunition. And over time, the water has rusted parts of these explosives away, making them very unstable. If it were to explode today, it would likely blow out windows on the nearest coastline, which is over a mile away and cause quite a lot of flooding. But to make sure this doesn't happen, no ships are allowed to sail within a certain distance of it. And although divers do visit the site so they can check on how much and how quickly it's falling apart, most divers are warned to stay well clear. Once we've recorded a site on the seabed, sometimes we may want to bring up parts of it to the surface for more study. At this stage, we have to conserve the artefact. You might have heard the term restoration before, but conservation is a little bit different. Whereas restoration aims to make something like new, conservation means to keep it in the same state in which we found it and not let it break down any further. So if we had a ship with lots of holes in it on the seabed, if we were to restore the ship, we would patch all of those holes and make it float again. But if we conserve the ship, we keep it just as we found it, full of those holes. We need to conserve artefacts because once they come out the water and air gets to them, so does the bacteria and the chemicals that cause them to rot and to rust. We need to take special care, particularly with wooden objects and shipwrecks that have been under the water. This is because water soaks into them and fills the gaps between the fibres in the wood and helps to support it. But when the wood dries out, the water stops filling those gaps and the wood can start to collapse and break as there's no longer anything there to support it. Some of you might recognise this ship here. These are the remains of the Mary Rose, one of the most well-known conservation projects in all of maritime archaeology. The conservators sprayed it with a special chemical which replaced all the water in those gaps and means the wood won't collapse. It took nearly 35 years to make this ship completely stable, but now it is expected to last for many, many more years. So that's pretty much the whole process, from our first research about the site to visiting it under the water, right the way through to making sure its artefacts are preserved for the future. Before I finish though, I'd like to answer some questions that were submitted by you guys at home. The first being, what subjects should you do at GCSE or at A-level and what other qualifications do you need? And my answer is really the ones you're interested in. Archaeology is one of those fields in which there is something for everyone. If you're really into art, you could look at getting involved in archaeological illustration. If you're good with computers, you can focus on mapping systems or making 3D models. If you like science, there are so many different ways all areas of science can be applied. Or if you like getting really hands on and making things, perhaps experimental archaeology is the area for you. Once you get to A level, especially if you're thinking about going to university and studying archaeology, then archaeology and history are, of course, good subjects to take, as well as geography, geology, biology or chemistry and English. A lot of archaeology does involve report writing. 
If you want to work under the water, you will, of course, need some diving qualifications. So if this is the bit that particularly interests you, start by searching British Sub Aqua Club or Paddy diving courses. The next question that was submitted was, what are the best and worst bits of your job? Well, one of my favourite bits of the job is getting to get hands on with stuff that is amazingly old. Being able to handle a flint hand axe that someone made 300,000 years ago will never stop blowing my mind. That time just feels so very far away from us here in the present. But at the same time, when that tool fits perfectly in your hand, it's a reminder that there's still a physical connection to that time long, long ago. One of the worst bits, though, can definitely be the smell. Intertidal mud especially can be a bit stinky and a bit slippery, so not so good if you get a welly boot stuck in it and get some muddy socks. The next question was, would you say you are more scientist or historian? Really, we're both. We use scientific methods to explore the past, but we can combine that with historic documents and the research techniques that historians use to put together all of the puzzle pieces and make the most complete picture of the past that we're able to. The final question is, does the preservation of archaeology sometimes clash with environmental conservation? Well, when looking at maritime archaeology, we always have to be mindful of our impact on the underwater environment. Shipwrecks become artificial reefs and home to lots of wildlife, so protecting the shipwrecks helps to protect that wildlife too. And vice versa, sometimes the rules that we put in place to protect environments will cover heritage and archaeology as well. Investigating wrecks and what is on the seabed is also a big part of the process when developers create new wind farms at sea. So generally, maritime archaeology works with the environment rather than against it. So that's it from me. I really hope you've enjoyed learning what it is to be a maritime archaeologist. If you have any questions, please do drop us a line on social media and we'll answer them in upcoming videos and posts. And we also have lots more educational resources available on our website, from interactive 3D models to activity booklets. There will also be lots more maritime archaeology content in the future, as we are now in the UN Decade of Ocean Science, which aims to find ocean science solutions for sustainable development and connect people with our oceans. So watch this space. Thank you very much for listening.